Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to a discussion about libertarianism and Freemasonry. Uh, what I'm going to do is read my uh, prepared remarks, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. So uh, first of all, my name is David Butler. I am a libertarian, uh, FSP member, and early mover, uh, and a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason. Um, for those in the audience who might not be familiar, uh, Freemasonry is an ancient fraternal organization uh, dedicated to charity, benevolence, community, morality, education, uh, truth and justice. Uh, Masonic lodges uh, exist all around the world. Uh, you know, it's funny when I tell people that um, I'm a Freemason, I actually get a mix of reactions, uh, you know, ranging from uh, genuine interest in, in what the organization's all about uh, to really downright suspicion, um, you know, because we run the world and we did 9-11 and all that stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's really surprising the, the kind of reactions that I do get. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, uh, what initially drew me into Freemasonry was the mystery and the secrecy and the uh, historical relevance. Um, the book that really hooked me was uh, Born in Blood uh, by Charles Robinson. Um, you know, if you have a chance, I highly recommend picking up that book because it's, it's an excellent, um, I guess, primer into exactly what Freemasonry is all about, where it came from. Um, you know, it's, it's a colorful book, I'll put it that way. Um, so I received my degrees in 1993 and 1994, and um, you know, let me just take a second to clarify uh, one of the points about the degrees uh, is no one is recruited into Freemasonry. It is an ask to join organization. Um, so we don't go after people, we don't tap them on the shoulder, you know, we don't approach people. Um, it's up to them you know, to actually approach us. Um, you know, so because the interest has to be from within. You, inside, you have to want to become a Mason. Um, you know, it's not something where we go out and pick people. Um, I actually think that was probably started by the anti-Masonic movement, which, you know, they started this rumor that you have to be recruited. And I've actually met people who were angry. I mean, there's, you know, 50-year-old guy, successful, and he's like, I don't understand why you people never recruited me. I'm like, because that's not what we do. We can't. I can't go to somebody and ask. You know, they have to come to me or to another Mason and ask to join So um, after joining, uh, I, I quickly realized that, you know, although Freemasonry may have been a major driving force in American and world history, uh, today it more closely resembles an Elks Club or a Moose Lodge. Um, you know, still it's a very civic organization, uh, many excellent charities, including uh, the Scottish Rite Speech Therapy Centers and the uh, Shriners Children's Hospitals. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Shriners Children's Hospitals, but any child can go and get free medical care. Uh, regardless of family income. I mean, it's an excellent organization. Um, some of the top hospitals in the country, uh, best doctors, you know, best technology. It's a very worthy organization. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, how Freemasonry relates to libertarianism and really more specifically, the classical liberal ideals and principles on which the country was founded. Um, and libertarianism you know, embodies those same principles today. Uh, as you may know, um, members of the fraternity have been some of the most influential movers and shakers in world history. Uh, for example, the American Revolutionary Leaders of 1776, uh, many of the drafters of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, um, and indeed the first presidents of the uh, new, newly formed United States were all Freemasons. Um, you know, in addition, many of the principal political actors of the uh, French Revolution were prominent French Freemasons, uh, mobilized under the uh, Masonic slogan of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, you know, moving forward in history, you find that the uh, great revolutions of the following century were also led by Freemasons. Uh, Simon Bolivar, Jose uh, de San Martin, and uh, Bernardo O'Higgins in South America. Uh, you had Vincente Guerrero and Benito Juarez in Mexico. Uh, Jose Marti in Cuba. Um, Jose Rizal in the Philippines. And Giuseppe Garibaldi in Italy. Um, you know, all Freemasons, all revolutionary leaders. Um, most notably, the Texans who uh, rebelled against the government in Mexico and fought a successful war of secession were predominantly Masons. Um, and indeed, all the presidents and vice presidents of the Republic of Texas were Masons. Um, the history of Freemasonry is inextricably interwoven with the revolutions of the 18th and 19th century. Um, the 18th century lodge records uh, actually speak quite a bit of the liberty of the brothers. Um, to the Masons of 18th century Britain, 
uh, world, uh, the word liberty um, was understood in the sense given to it by John Locke in his two treatises of government in 1690. Um, Locke wrote that we cannot be obliged to a government to which we had, have not given some sign of consent and that the purpose of law is to preserve and enlarge freedom. Governments are dissolved when they act contrary to their trust and power reverts to the people who may then establish a new legislative and executive. It is the people who decide when a breach of trust has occurred. So Masonic philosophy postulates freedom itself amongst the fundamental elements constituting a Mason. Freedom and tyranny are completely contra uh, contradictory concepts. Therefore, Freemasonry cannot be indifferent to tyranny. Uh, in fact, American Masons, uh, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, and many others uh, conspired and declared war against, the British, against British tyranny. Masons all over the world have dedicated their lives to affirming the principles that made it possible to evolve from a medieval and authoritarian type of society to a society founded on the rights of man. Uh, Freemason lodges were a startling innovation of the time. Their members met as individuals and equals in the lodges, leaving behind any position or status they may hold outside the lodge in society at large. This is a very, very important point. Masonic lodges were the first and for a long time the only organization that facilitated open social interaction between all members of society, you know, whether they were lords or commoners, uh, you know, wealthy or modest. It didn't matter because once you entered the door, you were just like everybody else. These innovative Freemasons did more than just simply convene and converse. They established a form of self-government complete with constitutions and laws, elections and representatives. They bestowed sovereignty on this private government, yet it could be in turn altered or removed entirely by the consent of a majority of the brethren. This was a world-changing a world changing event, really. Um, it created the framework for a new form of government. Uh, the Masonic Lodges actually became de facto schools for constitutional government. The Lodges taught men how to integrate enlightened values with the habits of governance. They became citizens in the modern sense of the word rather than mere subjects. The goal of government by consent was vigorously pursued by the Grand Lodge of London and was demanded of all lodges affiliated with it. The Lodge became a very effective mechanism for spreading this new civic and um, political culture based on constitutionalism and opposing rule based on privilege and divine right. This new culture is known today as the Enlightenment. For most of history, people's thought processes were irrational, polluted by religious dogma, and overconformed to historical precedent and irrelevant tradition. The way to escape was to seek true knowledge, to study the liberal arts and sciences, to discover the truth and build upon it. The Enlightenment, driven by Freemasonry, was classically liberal, or what we would call today libertarian, pro-science, and anti-superstition. The essence of the philosophy was reason, embodying common sense, observation, and a bias towards skepticism and freedom. The Masonic Lodge, the Philosophical Society, and the Scientific Academy became the underpinnings for the Republican and Democratic forms of government we know today. So that is the presentation. Um, at this point, I'd love to take some questions. And if you could, raise your hand. What? Oh, come up here. Gotcha. Plans change, sorry. Uh, so if you have questions, just come right up to the mic. Ask whatever you like. Check. There we go. Um, I actually got approached to join, and uh, I did a little reading, and I said, "Hey, wait a minute!" And you know, basically, that I what you just said—that I understood that you had to ask yourself; you could not be uh, recruited or approached. Right. And he said that that was uh, something which had recently changed. I was wondering if you knew anything about that, or perhaps. Yeah. So, because membership has been declining over the past many years, honestly, um, a lot of lodges are dying out. So they have loosened that restriction a bit, but um, traditionally, and it's still, I think it's still kind of frowned upon for people to go up and ask people. Mm -hmm. um, 
But uh, yeah, I, I think for me, you know, it's really all about the inside. You know, you have to want it on the inside, right? Uh, you have to be willing to make the change and really, real willing to invest yourself in it. Um, so I prefer that people ask to join. Uh, but you're right. I mean, officially, it is allowed, but I, I don't think it's encouraged at this point at all. Hmm. Okay. Could you uh, lead us through? An outline, I'll turn it. Thank you. an outline of the process of applying for membership, getting accepted, being welcomed into the organization, um, and what would one would expect in one's first year as a member in terms of activity, how often, presumably it's based on meetings, scheduled meetings. Yep. When, how long the meetings are, what kind of place, if, if it's in New Hampshire where I live, they would tend to take place, and what would happen during those meetings, and what activity is there outside of the meetings? So uh, let's start at the beginning, which is how do you join? Um, you find a Mason, and you say, I'd like to become a Mason. Um, that Mason will get you a, um, a form uh, to fill out for affiliation. Um, and every uh, Mason is a member of a lodge. Most towns have lodges. A lot of towns have little signs as you're coming into town uh, with the Masonic Lodge name on it. Um, most lodges today have a website. So you should be able to just you know search on the web for your town name or a large town near you and Masonic Lodge. And it should come right up. Um, you can, a lot of times, if the Masonic Lodge has an office that's open uh, outside of meeting times, uh, you know, you can just go in, uh, ask for a form, uh, you know, or um, just anyone you know. I mean, I can get you a form. Um, I don't have any with me, but I can get you one. Um, Facebook, a ton of lodges have presences on Facebook, so you can connect. I actually connected with the uh, guys in the Nashua Lodge um, through Facebook, so that's an excellent way to make those connections. Um, so basically, you fill out the form, um, they take it back, they read the form aloud in, lo in the next lodge meeting, and then they vote on whether or not to um, bring you in to confer the degrees. Uh, it, it's not anything scary, um, you know, it's, we're not turning people away at this point. <laughs> so, I mean, don't worry about that part. Um, and really, membership is open to any man of good character who uh, believes in a supreme being. It doesn't have to be a specific supreme being. Um, it's just there needs to be a supreme being. So that way, the oaths that you take actually have teeth, right? Because, you know, if you're not accountable to a higher power, then, you, you know, oaths mean nothing. Um, so there's no specific religious requirement other than just a belief in a supreme being. Uh, could be flying spaghetti monster if you like. Um, so once uh, they actually vote on you know whether or not to confer the degrees, at that point then um, you would be interviewed. Uh, there would be a, a like a little panel interview, usually in your home, uh, where they just come in and they talk to you. Uh, it's a very friendly encounter, um, and uh, yeah, nice people. I mean, re genuinely good people. Um, so you talk a little bit about what drew you to masonry, what do you know about masonry, do you have any questions about masonry, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, then, um, you know, once you pass that part, then they schedule the degree work, uh, which is uh, the first three degrees for the Blue Lodge, right, that's getting into masonry. Um, so you, you start out with the, um, the entered apprentice degree first, uh, then you take the fellow craft degree after that, and then the master mason degree after that. Uh, and each degree is a common, it's all done in, um, each degree is done like one night for one, you know, one night for another one, like this. So each degree is divided into two portions. You've got like a, um, a lecture and presentation, presentation portion um, where you uh, get the educational part of the evening. And then there's actually like a play, right? So then you participate in an actual like uh, performance. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, and it's better if you don't know anything about it. So I, I spoiled it for myself because I actually read about it before going to do it. If you intend to do it, I highly encourage not reading anything about it so that you can get the full effect because it is, it is pretty cool. Um, 
So then, uh, you know, after the degrees, uh, as far as what happens during the first year, you'll usually get um, quite a bit of encouragement to take on the different chairs. There are seven, seven different officers within the lodge. And, um, you know, you can actually run the chairs. You, you know, it takes a year for each one, right? But then eventually you wind up in the worshipful master seat in the east. So that would be like the highest person in the lodge. Um, and then you, you become a past master, and you know that's major street cred. Uh, length and frequency and typical time of meetings. Uh, I'll, just, I'll I'll repeat the question for this time, but next time use the microphone, buddy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the question was about um, uh, the length of the meetings, the timing of the meetings. Uh, so most lodges have monthly meetings, and it's called the stated meeting. Um, and that's usually where lodge business uh, is handled, right? So they pay the bills, they vote on new members, you know, they do all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's actually very, I won't say ritualistic. I mean, there's definitely things that we do every time and words that are said and, you know, uh, you know stuff happens, but there are no goats and um, everything is actually quite fun and calm and, you know, it's, it's a great experience. Um, and that's uh, usually monthly, and it's uh, sometimes in the summer. Lodges will go dark; they'll take a break, um, but you know, two or three months during the summer. But other than that, it's monthly meetings, and then you add on degree work. So they have to call everybody together outside of the stated meeting to do degree work, right? So that'll be another meeting, um, depending on how many new members you have and how often they come in. And uh, then there are also, you know picnics and social events and fundraisers and all kinds of charity stuff. So there's definitely a lot to keep you busy. Yeah, you, you mentioned the uh, so-called conspiracy theories. I think for, in that connection, it's interesting that Dan Brown's novel, The Lost Symbol, presents Washington, D.C. Uh, completely run by Freemasons using their secrecy behind the scenes to completely control all the levers of the federal government. And the plot is that a very wealthy sociopath uses his money to rise to the 33rd degree very quickly and then goes on a killing spree. And of course, all the other Freemasons are the good guys trying to stop him. I think this is a Romana Clay, and what it's really telling us is that there are people in Freemasonry who have uh, sworn, or they, they, the, the supreme being that they worship is Satan. There are many Satanists among us. They're big time in the US military. And I think a, a debauched wing of Freemasonry is indeed responsible for the very obviously Freemasonic act of 9-11, destroying the twin towers, the two towers of Hiram the Builder. I mean, come on. There's a, a book by a university professor friend of mine that's going to be coming out soon, I hope. Uh, that goes into this wealth of Freemasonic symbolism on, uh, surrounding 9-11, which was quite obviously a sort of coup d'etat attempt within Freemasonry. So could you address some of these issues? I really wish I could. Um, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no, uh, so to be fair, right, in any large organization, you're going to have bad apples, okay? And um, I have been remarkably surprised. All the Masons I've met, all the lodge meetings I've gone to, I've gone to lodges all across the country, and every person I've met has been just an outstanding person, just excellent people. Um, now, is there a you know secret group within Freemasonry that is out there doing evil stuff? Could be. I don't know. You know, just like there could be some evil Rotary Club members or something. You know, I think that there um, there definitely is the potential. Uh, you know, whenever you have a large social organization for people to get together and conspire and do things that are outside of the framework, uh, because there is absolutely nothing in Freemasonry as a um, as a framework, as a way to live your life, nothing that would support any of those activities. Um, you know, so, you know, is there some secret conclave within it that's doing some of this stuff? I have no clue. <laughs> uh, thanks for the, the talk. Um, uh, it uh, helped me understand uh, the most um, memorable conversation I ever had with my grandfather. He was a, a Mason. And he told me about the advantages of being a Mason, um, particularly when one would travel, that it'd be, you could find friends easily and so on. And um, 
he was speaking about it in such positive terms that I sort of wondered why he didn't specifically recommend that I become a Mason. It seemed like that's where that conversation was going, but from what you're saying today, I sort of understand a little bit better that he felt enjoined not to make that uh, remark to me. Yeah, at, at the time, I'm sure he couldn't, because at, you know, yeah. it, it, there has been a recent shift away from the, you know, no, absolutely, you can never ask somebody. So now it's, you know, hey, you know, the organization is dying, we need more people, right. so if you want to ask somebody, you can. Um, but yeah, I'm sure at the time you were having this conversation, it was absolutely forbidden. Yeah, it's like 20 years ago sort of thing. Yeah. Um, the, the question I've got also has to do with changes. With the internet and books being published about some of these uh, secrets, that uh, obviously there's a history of secrecy with Freemasonry. How has Masonry uh, responded to these, these, uh, the situation? So it's interesting. It, it, um, masonry is not necessarily a secret society. It's a society with secrets. Um, you know, everybody knows we exist. Everybody knows. You know, there's lodges all over town. It's not like we build subtle buildings, right? We usually have giant stone, you know, Masonic temples. Um, we're right out in the open. Uh, you know, we're members of the society. Uh, we uh, uh, members of society, meaning we're your friends and neighbors. You know, we're the people that you hang out with at the bar. Um, it just so happens we go to meetings, you know, a few times a month and um, hang out with each other. And uh, you know, we got a handshake and we got some words, and we just try to be better people. And we try to teach people how to be better people. Um, when we bring them in the door, uh, you know, we are assuming they're good to start out with, and we just try to make them better. Um, you know, not in any kind of forceful way, just, you know, encourage people through, uh, you know, the, the allegory and the stories and, you know, the things that we have uh, educationally in the lodge. So, um, does that answer the question? I'm not sure that I really answered your question. Oh, like changes to the order because of the revelation of the secrets. Right. Basically, yeah. I mean, have yeah. you become more open? Uh, uh, can one read all, all? Is it an open book now? Um, if, oh, yeah. Dude, if you, if, wanted you, to? if you go, you can Google this and this afternoon know every secret of the Freemasons. Okay, right. Honestly. I mean, it, it's just something where... So how has that changed? Well, it, it really hasn't because it's, it's more than just looking at a page on the Internet and saying, oh, okay, this is all, these are all the secrets of the Freemasons. It's more than that because it's a transformative experience actually going through receiving the degrees, you know, doing the, the charitable work and everything. It's supposed to transform you on the inside, you know, into a, um, so the three tenets, right? Like you've got brotherly love, you've got relief and truth, right? So brotherly love, pretty obvious, love your neighbor, you know, treat everybody well. Um, relief, you know, which is charity. So we provide relief to the poor and suffering and, uh, in truth, you know, just seek the truth. You know, don't get bogged down in, you know, religious dogma and superstition and all that stuff, but actually seek what the real truth is. So, you know, through these things, we, we hope people become better. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I think it's sad that it's such a great organization, it's such a great framework, and because everybody's so obsessed with the secrecy component, um, they go out and they're like, oh, you know, I, I read this website, expose, told me all the secrets, now I know the handshake. But until you've actually been through the experience and you've had the degree work and you've actually participated in the whole performance aspect of it, um, it doesn't sink in. It, it doesn't really mean anything. But when you actually put it into context and you've actually got that experience behind you, to go, oh, that's what that story means. Or that's why they tell this story and then this story and they finish with this story and I put it all together in my own heart and it's like, oh, now I get it, you know? But yeah, seriously, anybody that wants the secrets of Freemasonry, go out and Google it, but you will be doing yourself a disservice because it is, you know, really a much more quality experience to go through it. I was wondering if there, <coughs> If there's a different, like a different organization that also goes by Mason, I mean, you, you say Freemason, is there a different type of Mason? Uh, no, not that I'm aware. Okay. Um, yeah, Masons and Freemasons, that's just an interchangeable term. 
Um, you know, there are other organizations that are similar to Freemasons, like you got the Knights of Columbus, um, you know, obviously Elks and Moose and Rotary Club and Kiwanis and, you know, I mean, there's like a whole list of these civic organizations that are all pretty much loosely based on the Masonic framework. Um, you know, I will say that uh, Masonry is older and much more active politically. Um, it's not a political organization. It is a uh, tyranny resistor basically, you know, because we are big into freedom and liberty and, you know, personal responsibility and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, when you do have a tyrannical, oppressive government, a lot of times you need secret societies who know the handshake and can have back channels of communication. You know, there were uh, a ton of Masonic lodges that were still up and running in um, Nazi Germany, even though they were persecuted by the Nazis. I mean, the Nazis rounded up Freemasons, you know, and you know, executed them. Um, but they were still able to keep going, and they had little signs and symbols on the all wore like a little lapel, you know, flower, and that's how they recognized each other. Um, so they could have the support network for each other and their families and, you know, keep people alive who would otherwise have been wiped out. Thank you. So there's a persistence of conspiracy theories around uh, Freemasonry, and it seems much more than other secret societies. So you've got uh, Skull and Bones, that's got a bunch of conspiracy theories, but with the Freemasons, it seems like there's lizards, they run the fair, they did 9-11 and all sorts of things like that. Why do you think there's so many around Freemasonry compared to other secret societies? Because we're the oldest and the biggest. Okay. Well, it's why everybody picks on Microsoft, right? Because they're the biggest, right? So. You know, Microsoft sucks because they're Microsoft. Freemasonry sucks because it's Freemasonry, you know? It's the oldest and the biggest. Now it's Google. Google sucks more than Microsoft. Yeah, now Google sucks more than Microsoft. I agree. So you can go bing all this stuff later. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, Freemasonry being found, founded in classical liberalism. Yes. In your experience, would you describe members of the organization as classically liberal? I, I would actually describe most of the people that I've met because I've primarily been to lodges in the Midwest and the South, that they are, whether Republican or Democrat, I've met both, they all tend to be conservative, which is they're very um, fiscally conservative, right? So smaller government, you know, less taxes, things like that. Um, but they also have kind of a, uh, you know, I don't want to be bothered kind of thing, right? Like, I don't want the government in my business. And I think that's part of what draws people into Freemasonry because it is kind of a shield. It, you know, you walk into, a, you know, the lodge room and the stuff that happens in lodge stays in lodge, right? And I think people that are attracted to that kind of thing don't really necessarily want the government intrusion. They don't want the NSA reading their emails. They don't want all of this you know, stuff that's going on in our society today, um, you know, I think that they are just uh, innately resistant to that whole thing because it is a form of tyranny. You know, it really is. I mean, if, you know, if the government's reading your email and tapping your phone calls and, you know, taxing the hell out of you and is going to come lock you up for growing a plant, that's tyranny. And Freemasonry does not stand that for very long, so. Thank you. Yep. I just wanted to say, too, with all due respect to Dan Brown, if anybody wants to read a really good historical rip-snorter conspiracy uh, set of novels that has uh, Freemasonry in it, read Robert Anton Wilson's Historical Illuminatus. <laughs> Makes Dan Brown look like a kindergartner. <laughs> there are actually a lot of really good books out there that, um, that do a good job, like The Hiram Key. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's a great book on Freemasonry. Um, I actually do enjoy a lot of the historical uh, connect the dots kind of books where it's like, oh, you know, like um, Friday the 13th, right? Unlucky day. Why is Friday the 13th an unlucky day? That's because that's the day the, Knight Templar, uh, the Knights Templar were suppressed. So Knights Templar, you know, predecessor of Freemasonry, um, you know, getting called on the carpet. So if you get called on the carpet, that's a Freemasonic saying. Right? Because in Lodge, there's you know, the big carpet in the middle, and if you violated one of the Lodge rules, you get called on the carpet to explain yourself. Um, on the level. On the level. Yep. Exactly. I mean, um, getting, giving somebody the third degree. You know, that literally comes from the third degree, because it's fairly intense. <laughs> 
Does Freemasonry provide, I imagine it provides network, networking opportunities. Um, I would wonder if you could address networking opportunities that might be possible through, through being a Freemason. Absolutely, so I think that today, in today's context, um, other than the charity work, that's like the most important thing they do. Uh, you know, so uh, Freemasonry today is not the Freemasonry that was in the late 1700s that, you know, uh, freed our country from Britain. Um, Freemasonry today is very much a, uh, you know, a civic service type organization, a lot of charity work, and networking. And networking is a, is a big part of it that a lot of people don't really fully appreciate. The people that join Masonic Lodges tend to be... Um, you know, successful guys, you know, they, they own businesses, um, you know, or they have great jobs or whatever. Uh, and, and it's excellent business networking and social networking opportunities. Uh, I know people that have gotten jobs uh, from other brothers in the lodge, um, you know, people that have started businesses with other people in the lodge, uh, you know, so it, there are definitely, you know, both business and social networking opportunities in the lodge for sure and what you want to look for if you're actually interested in joining look for a lodge that's very active um, that has an updated website and uh, maybe has some younger members uh, you know because if everybody in lodge is 75 and older the social events are not that fun okay without shaking the sexism stick at you could you cover a little bit about what's available for women in Absolutely. As, on the outsides so, um, you know, that is one of the things that comes up quite a bit is like, oh, you don't allow women. Well, it's not entirely true. Uh, women are not, um, I mean, it's a private organization, so they can make their own rules, right? Um, so they have chosen to stick with tradition and, and history and not include women in the mainstream free, pre, free Masonic, you know, lodges and degree work. However, there are several organizations for women like... Um, uh, the Eastern Star, um, which is, you know, very similar uh, in a lot of respects. Uh, in Europe, they actually have what's called co-masonry, which is actually men and women going to lodge together. Um, so there are options out there, and I think there's actually, I can't remember, was it the Tall Cedars of Lebanon? Is that the Young Girls Society? And Rainbow, yeah, so you got Rainbow uh, for the younger girls. And so you got uh, Demolay for boys, Rainbow for girls, and then for women you've got the Eastern Star, and for men you've got the Masonic Lodge. Go ahead. So does Eastern Star function in a similar way as the Masons, or is it, you know, do they go through degrees? Do you know because yeah, will so, they tell you? <laughs> no, no. So you, you do have degree work. It is different, right? So it's not exactly the same. Um, I would say it's more girly. I mean, I don't want to sound sexist, okay? <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, it is a little more pomp and circumstance than what the guys go through. Um, you have, like, you know, prettier costumes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was curious about what uh, sort of rules you would have. I don't know if, you can, if you're free to say what, what these, but could you give us any examples? Is it like Ten Commandments stuff or, or what? No, you know, a lot of times it's just like um, lodges will have rules about, uh, you know, um, like no alcohol, right? So pretty universal, no, no alcohol allowed to lodge, right? So when you sneak in with a beer, you get caught. I have never actually seen anybody violate any of the rules because the rules are pretty tame. It's like don't chew chewing gum in school kind of rules. Um, yeah, I really haven't seen a lot of that. It hasn't really been an issue because usually, depending on the lodge, um, you usually show up in a suit, um, six o'clock you have dinner, seven o'clock they have the meeting, you know, by nine o'clock you're at home. You know, it's kind of a, a very tame thing. <laughs> uh, uh, could you please address uh, religious aspect a little bit more? Like you said uh, that one should believe in a God uh, in general but generally what kind of religion it is. And also, as I understand, my, many Masons, they were also attending Christian churches. Uh, so how does it fit together? So um, religion and Masonry is a, a very interesting topic, and we should probably do a whole talk on that sometime. Um, 
but there is no specific religious tie into it. Um, so yeah, a lot of them do tend to be Christian, but just because there are a lot of Christians in, in this country. Um, in other countries, you know, it could be uh, Hindu, it could be you know, Muslim, it could be anything. You know, there are a lot of Masonic lodges around the world who by default use um, you know, the Quran uh, for their holy book of law, right? Because you have to um, profess a belief in a supreme being. So that's like generic, right? So as long as you have a supreme being of some sort, you're fine. Um, doesn't have to be tied to any specific religion. Um, and then you have a book of law, which is your, you know, your version of a Bible. So it could be the Quran, could be, you know, the Christian Bible, whatever. You know, so there's really no specific tie-in. I'm just saying that I think in America it tends to be more Christian just because there's more Christians. What what fees and expected donations are there of Freemason members? So um, the donation part is entirely voluntary, and it's uh, you know just whatever donation you're making, usually around a charity or something. There are fees. There are yearly fees, um, and it depends on your level of activity, right? So if you just join the Blue Lodge, get the first three degrees, um, uh, it's like a hundred bucks a year or something. You know, it's not huge. So there's like an initiation fee to get you in, and then there's like a yearly fee after that. Um, well, with, uh, you know, like with anything, like any club, uh, there are other clubs to join. So like I joined the Scottish Rite. So now I have like uh, Scottish Rite fees as well as Blue Lodge fees, right? Now, if I join the Shrine, you know, become a Shriner, then I would have Shriner fees to pay. <laughs> so, you know, it's like any of these kind of civic organizations. The more involved you get, the more, you know, fees they want. <laughs> Hi. Um, <clears throat> So I have two questions, basically. It, how would you go about finding out about a lodge, like what the, the membership is like, if it's a group that you would click with? And secondly, if you become a member, is it possible to just go to other lodges? Are you considered like a visitor, or do you join these other lodges, or, or how does that work? Yeah, so you, when you affiliate with a lodge, you join that lodge, but then you're free to join, or to, you, you can visit other lodges, you know, uh, whenever you want, just make a connection with, uh, you know, a mason there in town and go to the lodge meeting, or just show up to the stated meeting, you know, because mostly they're published on the internet. Um, so as far as, uh, I apologize, the first part of the question again? <clears throat> oh, how you uh, find out what different lodges are like. Right, so the way I usually do it is um, I check out their website, and if it's a modern looking, updated you know, website, uh, that's a good sign. Um, they usually have a photo section, and it'll be photos of their charity events, and their lodge officers, and things like that, and I look for younger people. Okay. You know, so that's really, I, that's how I do it. You know, I just go on the internet, I'm like, okay, they got a bunch of 30 year olds, this mm -hmm. is great. <laughs> Thank you. A, a silly question, you mentioned yeah. a book of law. Yep. Could it be Newton's Principia? You know, I, I don't see why not. Okay. I mean, as long as, you know, you can tie that in with a uh, supreme being. I mean, okay. you know, if you, if you like Newton that much, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 people are not sticklers about that. If you find a lodge that's being a real stickler about, oh, you have to use the Christian Bible and you have to profess a belief in our God, leave. Just leave. You know, it's not worth it. Go to some place that's a little more accepting and tolerant because, honestly, I, I've never seen this happen, right? I'm just saying, you know, it's possible you'd find a lodge out there that's intolerant. Um, but that was one of the things that uh, anti-Masons used to... Uh, criticize masonry for was being so tolerant because we would tolerate everybody you know we didn't care what they were or what they did or what class they were or anything like that none of that mattered and we got a lot of crap for that back in the day hi honey you didn't describe how you went from third degree to 32nd i just thought maybe you'd like to say something about that sure so um what that is an excellent opportunity to clarify another misconception. So I'm a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason. Um, that does not garner me any more anything from my brethren, right? Uh, once you're a third degree, that's the most Mason you can possibly be, right? So you are third degree Master Mason, 
That's it. That is the highest level in masonry. Now, there are appendant bodies, like the Scottish Rite and the York Rite, where you can get further enlightenment, you know, further knowledge, but it doesn't make you a more important mason or have any more influence or anything like that. Um, and that, uh, you know, it's, well, and yet another misconception, people think it takes a long time. It's a weekend. It literally is a weekend. You go from third degree to 32nd degree in a weekend. You know, you start Friday night, you have some, uh, you know, they do, it's mostly just you're watching plays, really. Um, so you sit there, you watch the plays, uh, you know, Friday night, you know, we usually go, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night, and then all day Saturday, right, and then by Saturday night, you know, they finish up, they confer the 32nd, you get the ring, and you go home. You know, it doesn't take years to go from third to 32. It just, it's literally a weekend, um, which I know is disappointing to a lot of people, but that's the way it works. Um, so as far as, uh, you know, I think there was something else I was going to mention about that too, but I forgot. Anyway, I'll come back to it. Yes, sir. When you use the term knowledge, you gain some knowledge. <clears throat> uh, my experience is you go to school, uh, if you're an engineer, you gain knowledge in engineering. What, what, when you say knowledge, what kind of, no I, I don't know if, if it's uh, something you can talk about or what, but it's uh, questionable to me. What, what knowledge do you gain? So it's interesting. I was actually on um, Ernie Hancock's show, and he had the same kind of thing where he was like, okay, well, I'm, you know, I go through the degrees. I'm a mason. What do I get? You know, what, what, what is the stuff that you learn? Like, if I'm an electrician and I'm a journeyman electrician, I can then go and I can do electrical work. He's like, what do you get to do as a mason? It's internal, right? So the, the knowledge that you gain and the stories that, we're that we tell are all about growing you as a person, exposing you to situations that, um, you know, it's almost like Bible stories, you know? And in fact, some of, the, some of the Scottish Rite degrees are actually based on biblical stories. And the point is to actually, you know, show you like, this person had this, you know, awesome life, and then all of a sudden everything went wrong, and they had to make these huge sacrifices, but then everything got better again. You know, it's that sort of thing. It's really more of an internal growth type of lesson versus a functional knowledge type of lesson, if that makes sense. Two minutes. One last question. All right, this is pretty inside baseball. Um, I was told there was actually... Uh, a section of lodges that broke for separate separated themselves and are no longer recognized by Freemasonry in general that they're kind of like the black sheep of the Masons can you uh, talk about that so I think historically that has happened several times um, I don't know of a modern version of that so I mean if if you um, if you like send me some info on that I'd love to read it but I know that uh, oh go ahead well they're 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 an unrecognized lodge. They, like they've been shunned. In, that, that's happening today, though? Fairly recently. Wow. Yeah, like in the 20th century, late 20th century. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so with, uh, you know, historically, um, I know that there have been situations where, uh, you know, a lodge or a group of lodges have been um, kind of excommunicated, if you will, from the uh, organization. And, uh, you know, usually it's for doing really terrible stuff, um, you know, fraud, um, you know, defrauding a charity, you know, something like that. I mean, those are the, you know, the kind of things that uh, can happen. Um, but I, I'm not aware of a recent example, but uh, yeah, I'd love to, if you want to just afterwards, just let me know. Cool. So, any last questions? One more. The mason that you ask for an application, does it need to be a member of the lodge you are interested in? No. No, the form is generic. You actually fill in, you know, the lodge that you are applying to um, on the form. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be the same lodge because the form is generic. 
Cool, cool. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, go out there and enjoy your day. I'm not giving any more talks today, so I am going to really enjoy my day. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Picked up an angel whose left wing was broken I sewed him together with some string and a vision He raised his right hand and he gave me an answer My mouth opened wide and I asked many questions I see crowds of people all gathered around me they all want the truth, but they don't want to hear it I fear they will rob me if I dare to speak it But poverty bears the fruits of the prophet